These are, we stand for this because these are the most important words that will be spoken in our meeting today. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him and said, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. You may be seated. <coughs> Last week, we began our necessary conversation in our series that we've been in this fall called uh, Basic Training. And we're talking about the topic of sin and temptation. In Basic Training, we're looking at the, uh, talking about the foundational elements of the Christian faith. Again, when we say foundational, it doesn't mean that it's shallow. We're actually taking deep dive looks into these very important topics. And the one we're looking at right now is sin and temptation. And there's no better place to get an example for how to address this then the Lord Jesus himself, who felt the full weight of temptation in this life and was tempted in every way that we were, but he was successful. Uh, last week, we talked about the fact that Jesus didn't cheat, even though he was God. He was still 100% God and 100% man in a way that didn't conflict with each other. Even though he was still God, he did not use his divinity to cheat and make temptation easier for him to overcome. He bore the full weight of it in his man nature. And he did not have it uh, easier than we do. In fact, he had it harder because he resisted that temptation all the way till the end. Hebrews 2.18, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So because he's our high priest, now he understands. He understands what the war against temptation looks like. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with a temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Uh, we are weak when it comes to our efforts to endure temptation, but we are promised that Christ is our ever-present help in time of need. Now, oftentimes when we hear the phrase, time of need, we as humans think of things like, well, I'm out of money and I can't pay my bills. That's a time of need. Or, I'm sick. A family member is ill. Someone is hurt. Maybe I'm pulled over by the popo. Maybe I'm taking a test. And I didn't study for it. That's a time of need. The answer to facing temptation and succeeding is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Facing temptation is a time of need. A lot of times we brush it off and it's not that big of a deal, but it's just as much of a time of need as all of these other situations. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Failing to resist temptation and entering into sin is actually, in heaven's perspective, entering into an agreement with Satan to posture yourself against God. We don't have to think about it that way. I, I would reckon to believe that most of us don't intend for it to be that way, but that's what it is. And I don't mean to sound over dramatic, but every moment of temptation should sound off alarm sirens in our head. It should be a warning. Because to engage in an act of sin is to engage in an act of war 
and treason against the Holy One. On the flip side, to resist sin, to overcome, to not engage with sin when the opportunity is presented, is a showing of loyalty to the kingdom and the king, Jesus, and your fellow troops. So what you do when you're faced with temptation is a big deal. It's not a small deal. It's a big deal. And we have to start looking at it this way. In our lives, brothers and sisters, it's time for us to rise up and fight and take this issue of temptation seriously. It's time to fight against the pride that we so love to carry. It's time to fight against our love for money, whether that be to be wealthy and rich against the will of God, or whether it be because we simply want comfort and control. We have to fight against the, the, that idol of comfort that sometimes we choose over obedience to the scriptures. We have to stop choosing things that are easy when they're against God's will. It's time to fight against our passions that cause us to step outside of God's will and truth. It's time to a fight against the lies of culture and the ungodly passions that people say are good and acceptable. It's time to rise up and fight against the idolatry of ourselves, the idolatry of our own plans, and our own worship of ourselves and other people. We have to fight against this because the fight is worth it because we are in a war. It's time for us to not wait till tomorrow, but today, put away drunkenness, put away the substances that we use to cope, put away the pornography, put away the covetousness, put away the bitterness that we hold on to for the sake of power and control, put away the entertainment that plants seeds of corruption, put away education that instructs us into lies, Put away and be done with hypocrisy, slander, gossip, and games. It's time for us to stop playing the devil's game for him and to stand up and say, no, that's not the way I live anymore. You don't have power. These things don't have power over me. I don't have to subject myself to them. And I'm going to take the war against temptation and sin seriously. Come to your Lord. Submit yourself to his throne. Sure, his grace is bigger than your sin, and he has forgiven, released, and, and pulled you out from underneath its power and bondage. But then to enter again under the power of sin is to abuse the grace of God. If you call yourself a Christian, a born-again believer... Submitting yourself to Christ on the throne is something that you do every day and sometimes multiple times a day because the battle doesn't stop just because it's Wednesday. The battle continues on with or without your awareness. It continues on with or without your acknowledgement. It continues on with or without your care. It doesn't matter whether you want to acknowledge, be aware, or care about this battle. It happens anyway. You are in a war. This war will have its final uh, uh, come to blows at the Battle of Armageddon at the end times. But right now, we're smack dab in the middle of it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this topic of sin and temptation again. We're going to look at how Jesus overcame sin as our prime example. And so here's the things that we want to look at. One, why Jesus was successful. Number two, how the devil tempted Jesus. It, it does give us a little bit of benefit to investigate the strategies of the enemy. That's on our primary focus, but it, did, it is helpful. <coughs> Third, what did Jesus use to be successful? Okay, Remember, he didn't cheat. So he, he, we don't have divine nature to come and help us with sin. He didn't use his divine nature, and so we can follow his pattern here. And who does Jesus' success affect? Who does it benefit? Okay. Now, it's important to recognize that as we look through the three temptations, in this particular instance, that the devil is bringing upon Jesus, they are tailored to him. 
These temptations are tailored for Jesus, just like our temptations are tailored to us. I, for example, would not be tempted to turn stones into bread because I can't do it. You can come along and tempt me all you want, but I can't do it. So it's not a temptation for me. Now, I may be tempted to take bread that already exists, put too much garlic on it, slap a, a nice slap of butter covered in cheese and then dunk it in a pizza and eat the entire loaf. That would be sin, and I am certainly tempted to do that. But that is not the temptation here. I cannot turn stones into bread. Only Jesus can do that. I wouldn't be tempted to jump off of the temple First of all, it's a long drive to get there. It's in Jerusalem. The devil already knows I don't like long drives in the car. I have to take my kids. That's even worse. Okay? So he knows I'm not going to be tempted by that. Second, it sounds really ridiculous because the scriptures don't say the angels are going to swoop down and carry me. I'm going to go course flat. I may, however, be tempted to take over the world. <laughs> if Satan were to offer me to take over the world, I may be tempted by that. But ultimately, that isn't a temptation because we're not truly offered those things. These temptations are catered to Jesus, and it hits them right where it counts. They may not entice us a bunch, but for Jesus and his human nature, these were haymakers. Here's what we've got to learn from this. Satan tempts us at the point of our own abilities. And often, not always, but often, we are tempted with our own gifts. The temptation for Jesus was a temptation of what to do with his supernatural abilities. The devil was trying to get him to misuse them for his own selfish gain. Instead of using them for the Father's plan and the Father's purpose. But for us, Satan's approach is going to be tempting us with our own gifts and abilities. For example, a person with charm may be tempted to use that charm to manipulate people into getting what they want. A person that is a gifted caretaker may be tempted to over-care for others and possibly enable them while not caring for themselves and their own family. A gifted teacher can be tempted to become prideful through the numerous requests and outreaches for knowledge, the questions that they can answer. They may be tempted to, tempted to seek out secret knowledge, to take things that are not concrete, turn them concrete, and teach them as concrete, misleading God's people a, gifted, a, per, a person that is gifted in prayer might be tempted to take all that nice insider information about what's going on in people's lives and gossip about it to other people under the guise of prayer. A gifted person in business and finance may use it for personal gain, may twist the law a little bit to get what they want. A gifted orator will use words to manipulate. A gifted athlete may use their platform for people to look at them instead of looking at Christ. Or a spiritually gifted person may be tempted to demonstrate gifts under their own will and compulsion, thus creating and applying themselves to a false religion. The list goes on and on. I can give you tons of examples. Satan will often tempt you right, they will be tailored right where it hurts, right in your gifts. And it will often be to abuse your gifts, misuse them, pervert the reason and the purpose for them for his own gain. And this is really smart if you think about it. Satan, he doesn't really capitalize on this temptation thing. Is if he comes along and weakens what you already have, that's a strength that God has given you. He capitalizes most if he can take those gifts that God has given you and use them for his own gain. Yes. And this is the ultimate mockery, right? I'm going to take God's creation, his beloved creation that he has made, and then I'm going to take the gifts and the abilities that he has given these individuals, and I'm going to twist them ever so slightly to get them to point the use of them towards my purpose it's brilliant and it's dangerous for us it's sort of like this if you uh just to give you a very um hypothetical hyperbole uh, hyperbole type uh, example let's say you gifted a child with two hundred thousand dollars to go to um, college to get a degree in engineering and they end up using it to make a bomb that kills people like that would be the ultimate punch in the face, right? 
I gave you that money so you could get a good degree, so that you can get a job, provide for your family, so that you can get off on the right foot, maybe be benevolent in your, and then you go and you use the knowledge you gain from the money that I gave you to go and kill people. That, in essence, is what Satan does with us. Let me find a way to take what God has given them and use it for my purpose, to kill, steal, and destroy others. It's more than just about talents. Um, it's about who you are and your God-ordained role that God has called you to fill in your life. If you're a father that's actually at home in a fatherless culture, do you not think he wants you out of there? You are the protective head of the family unit. You are the spiritual leader. Satan wants you out first. If you're a mother that is filling other roles than being the mother, which I believe is the most important role in the family, uh, if you are filling other roles, trying to be the dad or trying to fill all these other things that is, that is not your God-given role that, that, and you're stepping out of your role as a mother that is crucial for the family, don't you think Satan wants there to not be a mother role because it's so important to the nurturing and the growing and the development of, of children and in the marriage? If you're in a marital covenant, don't you think God wants you looking outside of that covenant for fulfillment so Satan can now mock the institution of marriage that God has created? If you're a child, don't you think Satan wants you to rebel against your parents who are the roles of God's justice that have been put in your life for this period of time? And God's very institution where he says, honor your father and mother, don't you think Satan wants you to usurp them every time you turn around? Of course he does. If you're a faithful employee and a good example, don't you think Satan wants you to take just a little bit longer lunch, skip out on your responsibility, take some shortcuts, gossip on the boss. Everybody else gets a smoke break, so me too. So like, don't you think that Satan wants you breaking and bending the rules to ruin that witness, ruin that credibility in your job? Well, not just about the role, what about the platform? Uh, your family at home, your coworkers at the job, the community as a whole, the larger the platform, the greater opportunity that Satan has for destruction. That doesn't mean big platforms are bad, but it means the bigger the platform you have, the bigger on guard you have to be. Satan will tempt you with your gifts. He'll tempt you with your role. He'll tempt you with your platform. And let's be honest, some of us are just rolling over and letting him do it. That instead of fighting against it, we're just laying on the ground, rolling over and letting him do what he wants to do. Claiming to be faithful to Christ, but eating at the devil's table every chance we get, it, every time we get a chance. So, let's look at how Satan did this uh, temptation thing with Jesus and how Jesus went against it. Temptation number one, <coughs> verses three and four. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, we covered this last week, the first thing that, that this devil hits on is a questioning of Jesus' identity. If you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So he tempts him to turn these stones into bread. Jesus is hungry. He just completed a fast, 40-day fast. Is it wrong for Jesus to want to eat some bread. Is it wrong for Jesus to break his fast with some bread? Anybody? It's not wrong. Eating bread is not wrong. That's not the issue here. There's no indication he wanted to eat too much bread. It's just he wanted to eat bread. He was hungry. There's nothing wrong with that. So what is the temptation if Jesus eating bread was not the problem? Then what is the problem? Well, Jesus is the Son of God. This reality was declared by the Father himself as he spoke down from heaven, as the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove at his water baptism, just moments, just days before this. And the Father said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is hungry. He's alone in the middle of, uh, middle of the wilderness. Why would the Son of God be alone in the middle of a nasty wilderness in Judea hungry if he was so important. I mean, the Israelites were in the wilderness and they, were, they had each other. They weren't alone. And God dropped food supernaturally to them. And here Jesus says, there's no manna from, fallen from the sky for Jesus. There's no fellow Israelites to commune with in the middle of the wilderness. He's by himself. 
So why does the Son of God not get the treatment that everyone else gets? Why does he get treated worse? The temptation here is of mockery. If you really are God, then why are you out in the desert, desert by yourself starving? Why would the Father, who has these great... I'm just picturing myself as the devil. Not, yeah, well, that's kind of weird. I didn't do that, but the, you get what I'm saying. Like, I'm just picturing what he would think. Like, why, would the, the, why would your dad, if he was so good, and he had such a great plan for you, why would it be so terrible? Why would he leave you out in the middle of the stinky desert, hungry, and didn't, he didn't even bother to give you any food whenever you broke your fast? Why would he treat his own son like this? And, and, and if you get the foreshadowing here, this is a foreshadowing of the cross. Why would the father submit his own son, the best, to the worst and most difficult plan that any human being has ever had to follow through on? The temptation here was for Jesus to be selfish, to say, I won't re be regarded as the least. Even the Israelites had manna. Even the Israelites had water. Even the Israelites were not alone. So what's wrong in me turning some stones into bread? The temptation was for him to be selfish and to do what he wanted, to abuse his abilities outside the will of God so that he would be the son of God, or people would see him as that. The same temptation can befall us when we, are in, when we feel like we're entitled or owed something. Sometimes we feel entitled or owed something because we are a Christian. We feel like we're entitled or owed something from God because we're a Christian. Oh, I've done so much in this Christianity process. I literally was forgiven by just putting my faith in Christ. So God owes me riches and he owes me health and he owes me every single prayer that I've ever prayed answered. No, the only thing that we're owed is hell. And thanks be to God, by the grace of the Lord, we don't get what we deserve because Jesus Christ. That's the only thing we're entitled to. So sometimes we get in this place, we get selfish, we, we, we think we deserve an answer to prayer. We think we deserve all of these things. We deserve for God to bail us out of situations that we have created. But the reality is we don't deserve any of that. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad to pray for it. We can pray for it. We can pray, but it's always that the Lord's will be done. And with the understanding that if God doesn't give us what we want, he has a greater purpose involved. We don't get to abuse our gifts by using them for our own gain. We're not entitled. Jesus' response to this is three words. It is written. It is written. And my friends, that is the secret sauce to how you tackle every single temptation in your life. It is written. Jesus' response shows that he understood it wasn't about whether you had food in your body or not. If God wanted you to live, you live. If God doesn't want you to live, you don't live anymore. If a person was without food, but God wanted them to be alive, God would sustain their life even though they didn't have sustenance. Likewise, a person could have all the food they could ever want. And if God wanted their life extinguished, he'd do it anyway. So it wasn't a matter of bread keeping Jesus alive. It was the recognition that Jesus knew, as long as the Father wants me alive, I'll be alive according to his plan. And there's going to come a day in three years he doesn't want me alive anymore according to his purpose and his plan. And at that point, I'll submit to that too. That bread doesn't determine my fate. His response, man does not live like bread alone. That bread doesn't determine my fate. God determines my fate. And I will not reverse that so I can be selfish in the moment. Temptation number two. The authority of kingdoms, verse 5 through 8. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered over to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. 
And Jesus answered him, it is written. There's those three words again. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. What's interesting about this temptation is God has already promised the world to Jesus. He's already getting it. Psalm 2, 8, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. The world is going to be Jesus's. Now, we, there's a whole lot of theology in this, how God is still in control, but the devil is the ruler of the world because it's been get over to him from sin. That's, not gonna, that's a side note from our conversation today. But what we're looking at is that, that, that Jesus has been granted to be given back the world that the devil has stolen. So Satan has some level of authority, otherwise he wouldn't be able to say this, and so, uh, 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 or, or this whole scenario wouldn't work itself out. So Satan's going to give the world to Jesus for himself. Now, why would it be a temptation for Jesus to take something that was going to be his already eventually? It's sort of like this idea. You know, uh, I use this, this example in my view. You tell your kid, you do these two chores, you get a piece of candy. Um, what, what if you go ahead and give them the piece of candy and they don't do their chores? They get the skip, the hard part to get the good part. You don't want them to do that. You want, to, you want them to learn that you gotta go, you gotta work for something in order to get the prize at the end. So the temptation here is that, yeah, sure, eventually Jesus would obtain the world, but God's plan required him to go to the cross. The devil was gonna give him all of the things that God was gonna give him, and he got to skip the hard part. He'd be able to obtain everything that was promised him, but he wouldn't have to go to the cross to do it. That's the temptation. The problem is, is it would cost him his allegiance to the Father as he would have to bow to Satan. But what a temptation this is. Not for you and I. You and I, we've never been promised the world. But the devil is enticing him to skip all of the hard stuff and how this works itself out in our life, we are often tempted with this too. We can sometimes try to justify getting the end result, getting the candy, because the end result is nice. And the thing you're aiming for may be great. Maybe it's to start a business. Maybe it's to start a ministry. Maybe it's to plant a church. Maybe it's to go on missions journeys. Whatever that may be, right? It may be a good thing. But God doesn't just care that you arrive at some sort of destination or you achieve some sort of um, uh, thing. He cares how you get there. The journey matters as much as the end result, if not more. What happens if you get something like, okay, let's use this as an example. I would, if, if we won the lottery, several million dollars, and... I said, okay, each of you kids, I'm going to give you a million dollars toward just to start your life on. Um, I'm smiling because it sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but I said, I'm actually going to give that million dollars to you now while you're eight years old. What would that do? What would that do to my eight-year-old? You know him. <laughs> He'd buy every skateboard shop from here to California. He'd probably buy a football team. You can't buy it with a million dollars nowadays, but he, 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 would, he would spend it on candy. He would, what else would he spend it on? He'd spend it on all kinds of silly stuff. Video games, he'd, he'd probably buy an arcade. Legos, he'd buy every Lego known to man. He'd buy Lego. He'd buy the company if he could. He'd blow his money within a few couple months, right? Why? Because he's, he's not at a place where he's learned the discipline to be able to do this wisely. And so, yeah, you can get the end result, but if your character is flawed because you didn't learn what you had to learn in the journey, it doesn't matter whether you achieve the end result or not, you'll blow it all up in the end because you didn't become like Christ through the journey, and it doesn't matter whether you got to the goal, you're just going to screw it all up. The journey matters because along the way, God teaches us to become more like him. He sharpens us. He sharpens the iron. He, he runs us through trials, increases our faith so that when we arrive, we don't blow up the thing that he wants us to have. And the temptation here is to go ahead and take the end prize without all the work. 
It's to take the marathon award without all of the training that went into the race. That's skipping the race altogether. Bypassing the hard but arriving at the destination, that's cheating. That's compromise. Brother, sister, don't compromise. Do not take the easy road. The Bible instructs us not to. The easy road is wide. Many will find it. It is a path that leads to destruction. But narrow is the path that leads to life. And it is hard and few find it. Fight for the narrow path. Stop defaulting and rolling over and taking the easy way every time. That's what Jesus is being tempted with. Get what you want, but get it in a way that God hasn't ordained. Skip the hard stuff. Guess what? You don't get to skip the hard stuff. Be faithful. The only way you can be faithful in the results is to be faithful in the journey. Temptation number three, call for angelic help. Verse nine, and he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, again, he asked this question, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is a temptation to tempt God. To deliberately put God in a situation where he seemingly has to respond one way or another. Now, this is a very dangerous sin. And this is something that, that we probably have all stepped into from time to time. God, get me out of the mess I've created. Bail me out of my situation. I put myself here and now I'm tempting God and I'm saying, God, you got to do something about it. No, he doesn't. Now, in his grace, he will because he's a loving father. And he but we don't sit there and pin God in a corner. God, if you'll get me through this, I'll go be a missionary in Africa for the rest of my life. Don't tempt God. We can't put God in a corner. He is supreme. He is sovereign. He is holy. His plan is sovereign. Bill me out of my situation, and then I'll serve you. Pay my electric bill, and then I'll go back to church. Save me from my illness, and I'll serve you the rest of my, my days. Get me out of being in trouble, and I'll never do that thing again. That is tempting God. That's putting him in a corner in a situation where he has to respond one way or another, or seemingly he has to respond. We are, that's posturing ourselves as God. When we start bossing God around and saying, you have to do something about this, that's why this is so dangerous. It's blasphemous. So Satan's standing up there. He's like, just throw yourself off. The angels will catch you. Now, why is this, temp why is this tempting for Jesus? This whole him jumping off the pinnacle of the temple and being rescued by angels, this would have been public display of Jesus' divinity. He would have been recognized as God. Look at this guy who jumped off the temple and the angels had swept them off of his feet, laid him on the ground. Look at that spectacle. Look at that display. He must be the son of God. It would be easy to justify this as the right thing to do because then if more people know, more people will believe. That's never been the way that it's happened because God has given us everything we need to know that he exists. The people who have, reject, who, who have chosen not to believe him, it's not because they don't have enough evidence. It's because they reject Christ. They don't want to believe. God gave these people 500 some prophecies and he fulfilled every single dang one of them and they still wouldn't believe he healed people of leprosy he did all of these things he restored sight to the blind he raised people from the dead the temple shook and the veil split in two and there was darkness and earthquakes and all these things and they still cursed him it don't matter 
It may have seemed like, oh, man, that would be really cool. It would be like this really cool scene. The angels who swoop me down and people would be like, oh, he is Jesus. And then Jesus' life would have been easier because he wouldn't have to go around trying to convince people that he is the son of God, which is not what the father's plan was anyway. Because God already did all of the pre-prep work. It was all laid out. Anybody who doesn't see it is just simply doesn't want to, doesn't believe in God. Jesus could have skipped some of the hate, the rejection, the criticism. There may even have been a little bit of like, oh, here comes Jesus, the guy that swooped the angels down. It would have made his journey on earth a little easier had people seen this miraculous display. Maybe. I think this is how it works out in our lives. Often we don't feel significant, we feel overlooked, we feel unseen, we don't think people take us seriously, we believe that there are people that are rooting against us, or if there are, we hyper-focus on them rather than focusing on what the Lord wants out of us. We want to be respected, acknowledged, known, loved, respected, all of these things. The temptation to be viewed by other human beings as all these things will drive many of our decisions that we make in life, and rather than being obedient about Christ, we will look at man and we will say, man, if... If they would just see the angel swoop down and sweep me up, then they would know how special I am. But that's not our end goal. And sometimes it's not even the plan that God has for our life. Sometimes the plan that God actually has for our life is to be hated, persecuted, and treated, treated poorly for the gospel. If you're hated and treated poorly because you took two slices of pie from Aunt Susie's pie and Grandma's been very upset with you because you haven't dealt with that, that's a different issue. I'm talking about hated, treated poorly because of the gospel of which you stand and proclaim. In fact, this is guaranteed. 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed, meaning this is true. All, not some, not most, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ. Now, who's that? That's a Christian. All Christians desire to live a godly life in Christ. You can't be a Christian and not have that desire. Will be, not may be, not likely, will be persecuted. So it actually is a part of God's plan that you are mistreated, abused, overlooked, all these things for the purposes of the gospel. It was a plan for Jesus as well. For Jesus to throw him and have this miraculous display, it would again be taking the gifts that Jesus has, abusing them for his own selfish gain to make his life a little bit easier. And how many times do we walk straight into agreements with the devil to make our life a little bit easier to avoid the persecution, the struggle, and the pain that comes along with sometimes standing on the truth? Hmm. We, it's almost like we make this under-the-table deal with Satan. Hey, I'll be quiet about the gospel, and I'll be quiet if you just have, if you just have people lay off me a little bit. It is a guarantee. Trying to escape it is the same Jesus that the same sin that Jesus is being tempted with here. Have this miraculous display in front of people look really cool and spiritual, and maybe they'll question you less. No. Jesus knew this, this would be tempting God, putting God in a place where he expected him to respond, all for a selfish motivation. I'm so thankful that Jesus not only withstood and overcame the temptations in the wilderness during this time, but I'm also thankful that he withstood and he overcame every temptation that happened throughout the entire duration of his life. Satan was hard at work with Jesus trying to get him to falter, to, to cave, to be selfish, and he never once was, and so now he becomes our great high priest that suffered in every way that we were, endured every temptation, and overcame, and so now he can reason with us, he can see what we go through, but also he can provide the ever-present help in time of need. And my friend, when we're tempted, it is a time of need. It is a desperate time of need that requires a complete dependence on the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome and bring glory to God when we succeed under the power of God and we're able to say that we showed loyalty to the kingdom and we overcame. And you never know, there are generations, even if you're not, I 
apparent. There are generations of Christians, believers, children that are waiting for someone to break the trend and break the chain and actually stand up and fight temptation once so they have shoulders to stand on and they don't have to correct all the sins of the previous generation. Why is this generation struggling so much? It could be because, the I don't know, our generation, the generation before them, we screwed it up for them, and they, they had to start in a place, that they, they had to start from negative 20 instead of starting from positive 20. But we have an opportunity to do that now, to break the trend, to stand up and fight. This is a war. When are we going to wake up, stop rolling over, making underhand tables with the devil and following through and doing his own work for him using God's abilities that he's put inside of us, when are we going to stop and fight for the sake of the kingdom? I am thankful that Jesus overcame temptation. You know what his success means for you and I? This is the gospel. It is simple. You don't have to overcomplicate it. It is the simple gospel for a reason. Because Jesus was tempted, because Jesus overcame, because Jesus followed through on the Father's plan, every I dotted, every T crossed, every J perfectly hooked underneath the line Because Jesus did that, and he didn't take the easy path, he took the hard path, he went all the way to the cross, withstood the most worst, uh, heinous forms of execution, the perfected Roman uh, 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 crucifixion, because he went through that, bore the weight of sin on top of him, all of our sin, because he did that, now today we put our faith in him, we're legally declared righteous, and we are given eternal life. What are, now, we can't reproduce the same results because we're not Jesus. We don't have his plan, and we're not God. But at the end of the day, what kind of fruit can come from your life if you were to follow the Father's plan too? We have to start thinking about the results of our decisions today and what they're going to ripple in to tomorrow and eternity. Because the small decisions to eat at the devil's table today are going to reap death tomorrow. But if today you will put away the things of the flesh, if you'll put away the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and you will submit yourself fully to the kingdom of God, What kind of things can come out of your life? I don't think you can even begin to fathom it. Now, we don't do that for the significance of it. We do it for the kingdom of God. I'm telling you right now, if all that comes out of a faithful life led in the Lord Jesus Christ is that your kids have shoulders to stand on, then you did your job. And that's a lot more than what a lot of people are doing. It's time to face temptation. It's time to take this war seriously. You don't have to do the sin anymore. It doesn't have power over you. You're not in chains and shackles to it anymore. You are set free. And you're not set free to continue in sin, further abusing the grace of God, saying, well, forgive me anyway. You are set free to glorify God in the fact that you don't have to be captive to that old master that wanted to kill you that you reign over it now all you got to do is walk in that truth is there an area in your life that you're thinking about right now i am held captive i'm a christian so jesus has released me from the captivity i willingly went and put the handcuffs back on and chained myself back to it Well, Jesus isn't keeping you there. He set you free. All you got to do is pull the handcuffs and leave. But you like being handcuffed to it because it feels nice and it's familiar. All you got to do is pull that handcuff free and walk away. What's that thing that needs to happen right now in your life? You need to pull the handcuff free and walk away. It starts with the word. It is written. How in the world are you ever going to combat the schemes of the devil unless you know the word? And not just know the word, know the word. Not just read it, study it. Because Satan knew the word. He used the word against Jesus. 
but he used it in wrong context, and he used a twisted version of it to try to manipulate. But Jesus knew what the Bible actually said. It starts there. Wow, this, this series, here we are, 13, 14 weeks, and it all it keeps coming back to this book. Let's pray.